Shalom and greetings. We are looking at the personal correspondence of Pontius Pilate. This is part three, and we hope you are enjoying this. Please click the subscribe and the notify, and be sure to catch us in the future. So we're going to finish this off. This is a letter from Pontius Pilate connecting to the last ones and the last videos. Go back if you missed them, but here we go. This one is from Yerushalayim, and it is from Pilate, and it is on Jerusalem for the Passover. So it is written from Yerushalayim. <clears throat> I have come up, as usual, for the great festival of Passover. It amuses me when I receive your letter just before leaving Caesarea to find you contemplating in the congestion of in Rome. You should be here, Judea, where it is has been filling up for weeks past. They come by tens of thousands. Weeks in advance and spread over the country visiting their friends and relatives searching out the villages their fathers came from and making pilgrimages to the place where their history began during the last week they have been concentrating on Yerushalayim every ship that has reached Caesarea has been crowded inside and out. The conditions on board, some of them must have been disgusting. You never saw such a medley as passes out of th from these ships. Some of them must have spent their last penny in paying for fare. Not a few have got here without paying any fare at all. You know the sort of mixture that comes out from the games of Rome, riffraff, from the slums and blue blood cheek by Joe. It is the same here, and Jewish blue blood has no more liking for riffraff than blue blood has in Rome. They smell abominably. You should see the aristocrats turning up their rich and learned noses. The whole lot throngs the roads, the steam and continuous from the coast, from Samaria and from Jericho. Many of them sleep in the open. Some of them wealthier bring tents and beddings with them. And in Jerusalem and the neighborhood, every, everybody who can, can takes in lodgers. They charge a pretty price. Foodstuffs are doubling and trebled in price. I believe the language that the foreign Jew uses about their brethren in Judea shocks even the Greeks. Today when I approached there was a complete block for a good mile of the city and it was not been for some stout work by my escort I should still be kicking my heels outside the wall. I have my total force in readiness. Over 2,000 men. There is no reason to anticipate anything beyond the usual brawls, but one must be prudent. You know how religion always excites the lowest passion. The Jerusalem Jew is at his worst at these times, and the visitors resent his arrogance. They are most apt to brawl in the temple <clears throat> that being the heart and kernel of their worship. And 
the synagogues are not are not so dangerous because most of these foreign communities have each a synagogue of of their own <clears throat> where they can agree fairly well but in the temple they all meet together and can quarrel about pri priority in offering sacrifices or about the inadequacy of other people's gifts or about being more Jewish Jews than one another. Having got through earlier Passovers without serious disturbance, I have no reason to be anxious. The danger lies in the immense suppressed excitement that underlies the festival. They work themselves up to a state of ecstasy. With all these thousands gathered from far ends of the earth, they imagine themselves a free and independent people. They live again in the world, the old days, they think that their Yahweh has only to perform one of his preposterous wonders and we Romans would vanish in the wind if we spark if we spark were handy a fire might easily be lit do you know that since i arrived today the jews have been complaining that I have not expedited the carriage of foodstuffs to the city. They blocked the roads and then complain that the food carts don't come through. But that is their way. They are intractable. If the place were full of pigs, they would sooner starve than eat. I will let you know how we go on. Jerusalem and the reappearance of Yahusha. Do you remember the preacher Yahusha who fled to Syria some months ago to save his life about from Antipas? He has appeared again. What's more, you may think it incredible but it is true, he is on his way to Yerushalayim. My spies report that having passed hurriedly through Galilee, he has crossed the frontier. I have dispatched agents to him in touch to keep touch with him. According to present information, he denounces the priests and Pharisees at every step and avows his intentions to be in Jerusalem for the Passover. He brings a following with him. I suppose there are always people who are tired of life. It was good for you to find me an expert on vine culture so quickly. These Jews have wits, none sharper, and they are industrious, but they are sadly lacking in scientific knowledge. If they were not bled by their, pro their priests, they would have much more money for random or modern knowledge and equipment. But what can you do when a bloated corporation of priests fattens on an impoverished people. Send your expert at once, I pray you. By the way of Alexandria, and he shall go straight out on a round of, the of a country visit. Next entry, J Jerusalem. So far, all goes well. I derive a modest amusement from what I hear of the divisions of the jealousies among these different Jews. Remarkable, enough at a time 
they are much more so than the foreign Jews are here. To begin with, the extreme Pharisee despise even the Jews in their own country who do not belong to their special sect. To them, a man is good, that is to say virtuous, if he observes the law minutely and not otherwise. I assure you that if they have a woman of a common folk to work in the house, they think the house and all the inmates are made unclean by it. You may imagine how much greater is their contempt for the Jews for Egypt or Syria, who actually mix with heathen folk like you and me, or Sejanius and Caesar. The foreign Jews resent this arrogance. Many of them are extremely rich. Many of them, especially those from Egypt, Mitzrayim, Alexandria, and more learned than the Pharisaic critics. And, of course, they are civilized, yet they, when they go into the temple, mix with the Pharisees and listen to the lectures of the learned. They find themselves treated with sneers and insinuations that they are little better than the Greeks whose language they speak. And often enough, it is only language that they do speak, since they have either neither Hebrew nor Aramaic on several occasions, the rank and file have almost come to blows. But this is a harmless reaction, and I do not interfere. You will expect to hear more about the preacher Yahusha. I am for two reasons proceeding cautiously. My first thought was to arrest him before he entered Yerushalayim and came in contact with the crowds. But that, of course, would have its dangers. At a time like this, since he crossed the frontier, he has done nothing openly to justify it. His followers would spread the reports that I had seized a noble patriotic Jew. And so, figuring once more as the oppressor, I might have on my hands a sudden outburst of passion of the kind which I desire to avoid. Besides, Ananias and Caiaphas have both been to see me. It was at once apparent that they, and especially Ananias, were extremely desirous that I should remove what they considered a danger to themselves. They hate the man, and no doubt, with good reason, the Pharisees and lawyers are really disturbed about the attacks of the law. The priesthood sense a danger to its livelihood, while Ananias and Caiaphas and the other noble Sadducees are not only concerned for the maintenance of their whole priestly system, as they are pretty in, indifferent themselves about the law, but fear some sudden turn of affairs which might convert this Yahusha into a national hero. And then, what would become of them and their power? I suggest to you, as a subject of one of your plays or mediations, that the greatest stimulant of all to man's activities is the desire for power. 
they suggested to me, remembering what had happened in Galilee, it would be wise for me to seize Yahusha quietly and put him out of the way. I am not, however, so stupid as to pull the chestnuts out of the fire for them and bring on myself an unnecessary odium. I replied that the trouble was primarily their affair, but undoubtedly it might concern me at any moment. I wished to avoid a tumult, and presumed that was also their desire. They were empathetic that it was so. I said that I should hold my hand for the present, but that if there were any disturbances, it would act at once, and I expected their loyal cooperation. This they promised me. If nothing happens during the festival, it is my intention though I did not tell them this, to wait until the crowds disperse again and then make an end of Yahusha. I cannot allow him to stir up Judea as he stirs up Galilee. If he provokes trouble against the festival, whether by his own act or by the people losing their heads over him, even against his will, I shall strike at once. But the priests must cooperate, and I am certain they will. Do you understand fully why they will? Not only because they hate this particular man, though they do, but because if they stand out the case may easily become one of the nation against the wicked governor, which does not suit their plans, and because also there are some of them whose names I know, and they know that I know, who are tarred with the anti-Roman brush and had better show themselves zealous to assist me when the chance is offered them. Yahusha is in Yerushalayim. He entered yesterday. His entry, if he had any intentions of raising the populace, was a failure. Few of them knew about it. He came up by the road of Jericho, it was crowded with youths from Euphrates region and from Syria, who had never heard of him. If there were any Galileans who recognized him, they would only remember that he failed them in Galilee last year. His own immediate followers are poor stuff. I had Alexander following the group and Yosef mingling with the general crowd. They are ignorant and superstitious men who are only dangerous because they share the usual delusion about leaders of this kind. They are always expecting Yahusha to perform a wonder, whether it is bringing to life a dead man or killing a live one. And they think about him just like the peasants and workmen of Galilee, expecting him at any moment to set about delivering the nation and bringing in a new age. I know this by time the Jew in his own country can scarcely think in any other terms. There is no evidence yesterday, and any more than there is has been before, that he, preacher, the preacher, 
takes his view of himself. He entered with no more than a stir that there was usually is when a party escorts some local nobility. His followers shouted themselves hoarse, and a few others, seeing them do so, shouted too. If six men threw their caps up for a reason, six others of the herd will follow suit. I had taken all precautions. I had some disguised soldiers walking with the crowd from Jericho, and some more at the entrance of the city. Marcus had orders if any attempted attempt was made to rouse the mob to cut down Yahusha and his followers at once, but nothing happened. That is not to say that nothing will happen. Alexander wormed himself into the confidence of some of the preacher's followers. He says they have the most extraordinary ideas about the brilliant change that is going to come over their fortunes, but that all that their leader intends. Alexander is positive about this, is to pursue in Jerusalem his quarrel with the priesthood and the law. It is enough. I hope I, I hope I am not mistaken in believing that you are interested in these long explanations. Were I writing to anyone else, I would say merely what I have cause to fear another pestilent agitation and that I mean to crush it while I may. Yerushalayim, scenes in the temple and decision to arrest Yahusha. Both Herod Antipas and Brother Philip are in Yerushalayim. These princelings behave as though they owned the East. They have brought rich presents for the temple. They pose their cultive for the Jews. They go in procession to and from the temple service, and the mob, which has forgotten how many Jews, old Herod tortured, burned, or crucified, claps and cries out for them as though it was would be a fine thing to have a Herod instead of me at the Antonius. I have not met the princes, but I have stationed a guard of Rome soldiered at their gates. It is a proper mark of respect. It is also a hint that we keep an eye on them. Some of the noble families who supported the father have sent representatives to wait on the sons and accompany them to the temple, but the ruling courtier, those who have office and those who hope to have it, hold aloof, they know which side their bread is buttered. This affair of Yahusha is coming to a head yesterday, accompanied by his immediate followers, he visited the temple. He stopped in the outer court, which is an enormous place like a fairground, full of the paraphernalia for temple gift and sacrifices. The thronged and thronged by thousands of Jews, chafing and arguing at the top of their voices in a score of languages and dialects. You know the market of theirs in Rome, which one takes visitors to see from curiosity. Uh, it is like that with a hundred times more hubbub. 
Suddenly, Yahusha began to assail his enemies and priests and all their works in the most violent terms. So far as I can learn, he denounced the whole ritual mongering business of the temple. Very sensible too, expect, except for his own safety. Had he been understood or attracted wide attention, he would have been murdered on the spot. If you remember that the life of the Jews, not only here, but to the far ends of the earth, centers in the temple worship and that is a highly organized business controlled by a powerful and jealous corporation. You will see that only a mad man or a suicide would act like this. As he went, there was only a scuffle and the things passed off. It was rather like his entry into the big city. He himself speaks Aramaic, and a large part of his hearers would have no idea of his, of his meanings. Besides, the noise is appalling. You know the Jews, if you are not noisy, they think that you are ill. Nothing whatever came of the affair, and it was intended as a demonstration. It was another failure. Yahusha soon left the temple again, together with his followers, who, according to my reports, are getting nothing out of their visit to Yerushalayim, but charging and disappointment. This is not at all the sort of thing which they anticipated. Denunciations of the temple worship in the temple are likely to have an unfortunate end for them, as they probably suspect. This incident was played into my hands. The man is an avowed failure, ignored at first, he has now offended beyond forgiveness. Few people may have heard and seen his outburst, but a great many will know about it before tonight. You may say that if he has failed so significantly, he is also negligible, possibly, but there is a risk, and I do not take the risk. Consider the audacity of his action. To me, who knows these people? It is almost inconceivable to challenge the priesthood in their sacred citadel and at the Passover backed by a handful of peasants more ignorant even than himself. I could laugh at the thoughts where if a man so rash and passionate and at the same time so determined might make another sort of appeal tomorrow which might have a different ending. I have determined to suppress him. Uh, public opinion, thanks, thanks to his folly, will support me. Still, I shall have the arrest carried through as quietly as possible in conjunction with the Sanhedrin, as companions will have no trouble. After the scene in the temple, the old fox, Ananias, sent an envoy to me. More than anyone he has 
a vested interest in the maintain, maintenance of shalom, peace. As you know, he has several sons whom he intends for the highest offices. At the same time, he has his finger on the pulse of the Pharisees, who are rebels at heart against us and would help us help any seditious movement if it had a serious foundation. His point is the same as my own, that Yahusha is not an act is not an actual but a potential danger. He urges that we should strike while few people know him, and while those who do, and they will be increasingly increased hourly, are shocked by his gross impiety, Ananias's words, he adds that if necessary, they will produce one of Yahusha's own followers who will give a damning evidence about certain ambitions which his master has avowed in private conversations. That does not concern me. I don't doubt they will provide themselves with the evidence they want, but I have already all that I require, the bottom and the top of it is that the man is or might be a political danger to me, as Antipas thought he was in Galilee last year, and as Antipas recognized the preacher Yochanan to be, when he cut off his head at Machaerus and so saved me the trouble. I am, concern, I am concerting with the priests. Yahusha and his followers spend their nights outside of Yerushalayim. We know the place. We, he will be arrested quietly and executed without undue delay. I had not thought of it before, but I think I shall give my friend Antipas the opportunity of condemning Yahusha. The trouble began within his jurisdiction so that it is the correct and polite thing to do. Besides, it would be pleasant to show Antipas both that a mischief maker has slipped through his hands but not through mine, and also that when he has condemned his subject, that ha he has to hand him over to the superior authority, the Roman governor, for execution of sentence. Yes, I will send him to Antipas. The Arrest of Yahusha from Jerusalem. Your freedman, Crito, has arrived this morning, bringing your letters, and others which he had picked up for me at Caesarea. He starts back again at once, so that the letter I write you now must be a short one. I wish it to be only your letter he had brought me. He gave me the pleasure which I always experience in hearing about you in Rome. But no sooner had I read them than I was thrown into ill-tempered by the news from Caesarea. You know, I am sure, I have told you this before, that when the Passover is finished and a large part of the foreign Jews troops back to the coast on their way home. I hold games in Caesarea for several days. It is a relaxation for me, as well as for them, and it is, a, is good for trade. You, do you know whether they came to my games? Of course they came. They are not Pharisees. They are Greek Jews.
Syriac Jews, Asteric Jews, merrier and humaner folk than their harsh Judaic brothers. Could anything be more exacerbating than a blow which has befallen me? In the play, first place, a ship brings six lions to uh, Caesarea has foundered. The crew has not even the good grace to go down with the ship. Still, the lions are cheap, and I do not make too much of it. What is more serious is the loss of my gladiator, Aducticus, a Gaul. He was the best swordsman in the East. Since I came out here, he had fought nearly fifty contests and had never been beaten. The women loved him. The governors of both Syria and Egypt had tried to buy him from me once or twice, and I lent him as a great favor, but I always refused to sell. I and I had told him that when he completed fifty contests, I would give him his freedom and make him trainer of the troop. He might have become manager of the games. He might have gone back with me and become first favorite of the crowd of Rome. Why? He might have caught Caesar's eye entered his household and controlled provincial governors. With his, this career before him, and knowing the value that I attached to him, he was an inconsiderable enough to enter into a tavern brawl about a girl with two Thracians. They stabbed him to death and then took their own lives so that I have not even the poor consolation of using them for the games. I am annoyed. You were asked about the aqueduct. It works admirably, and I have reason to know that the foreign Jews applaud me for it. They disapprove as they are bound to do of my use of the temple money, but they see that I am not behind the governors of more important provinces in my care for the Roman name and the health of my people. The Jews here also use the water, even the Pharisees. The only difference is that they show no gratitude. Yahusha was arrested last late last night. I provided a troop of soldiers to who accompanied the officers of the Sanhedrin. The advantage is that as the news spreads this morning, as it did spread, it would be known that procurator and Sanhedrin had acted jointly. The Sanhedrin are not popular with most zealous Jews, but the general impression would be that if all the authorities, Roman and Jewish, were acting together, this must be a troublesome fellow who was better out of the way. The arrest was made without disturbance. Yahusha himself gave no trouble, and his followers ran at once. I believe some of them are well on their way home. The prisoner was taken to the Kohen Hagadol, the high priest's quarters, until this morning when he was handed over to my people. I believe Caiaphas got a few of the leading priests together and they examined him for themselves. The case is a perfectly simple one, from my point of view, 
and will give no difficulty, since Antipas will not handle the matter. I am coming to that in a moment. I shall execute Yahusha as a maker or a cause of sedition against Kaisar. But these priests have always to remember that sedition against Kaisar is usually a merit in the eyes of the populace and of a good many Pharisees as well. And they will want to make out a good case for themselves. They will insist, I suppose, on Yahusha's uh, defiance of the Torah, their law, attacks on the ritual and the outbreak in the temple. Probably they will say that he regarded himself as the expected Messiah, of which there is no evidence, and the people with their mouths agape have no use for Messiah and cannot keep himself out of the hands of the despised Romans. That is not the kind of deliverer of the Jews want any more than any of his own followers. I have not seen the man myself, though I shall do so presently. I gave orders for him to be taken to Antipas, as I said I would, with a polite statement that as a disturber of the peace was a Galilean, he would perhaps consider the matter came without within his jurisdiction. I received a reply equally polite the, that Antipas recognized my courtesy but waived any right that he might have over an offender in my city of Jerusalem. A touching exchange of courtesies. I shall finish the matter off today. By the way, your freedman waits, but one word more. Is it true, as I hear from L Lentelius Spinther, that Sejanius' nephew has been refused an audience by Caesar, and that Sejanius has doubled the Praetorian Guard at Rome. What if Sejanius falls? What if he refuses to fall? Do, do not become famous too hastily, my friend, obscurity through inglorious is safe. When the master walks through the fields with stick in hand, fortunate is the poppy with in, inconspicuous head. Read that again. Obscure though inglorious is safe, when the master walks through the fields with a stick in hand, fortunate is the poppy with unconspicuous head. The trial and execution of Yahusha, Yerushalayim. I must complete the letter which I began this morning. Immediately after dispatching Crito, I confirmed with Marcius the military arrangements for the Passover, which began tomorrow. I heard reports from Yosef, who thinks that acts of violence against individuals amongst the ruling Sadducees will grow. In his opinion, it does not much matter whether the province is as quiet as I contrive to keep it or whether there is consistent friction between us and the Jews. His feeling is that the, that the extreme men are tired of peace. Afterwards, I 
tried and condemned the prisoner Yahusha. He was crucified at once along with some of the other prisoners who are awaiting execution. It is not a bad thing to have an object lesson of this kind on the eve of the Passover, because in such nondescript gathering as we have here, there must always be dangerous characters who have exceptional opportunities with their special qualities. By this time, Yahusha is buried. It is the custom to bury an executed offender the same day, and besides, the Sabbath begins at sunset. Has indeed already begun. The Sanhedrin asks, asked permission to bury the body this afternoon. It suits them, having got Yahusha out of the way, to dispose the whole matter before the Passover Pasach began, and so to damp down any distractions which might arise, especially after the inscription that I ordered to be attached to the prisoner, about which more presently. The trial was short, but in due form and order. Yahusha was accused of disturbing the peace, stirring up disaffection, and claiming to be a melech, a king of the Jews. There was evidence both from our side and from the that of the Jews, both from Galilee and from this city. Caiaphas, Ananias, and the leading Sadducees were prominent, and were so and were some, but not all, of the chief Pharisees. Some of the Pharisees would lend no assistance in convicting a rebel against Caesar, however much they desired his death as a rebel against themselves. However, that did not help him. The priests had much to say of his attack on their religion, but I cut them short on that. They cannot have it both ways. If we are not allowed to interfere in their religion, they cannot appeal to us when their observances are attacked. As soon as the offense became political, directly or indirectly, then we take note of it. They may squabble about Yahweh, like the Egyptians about Isis, till they burst. But when a man brawls in the temple, he tends to provoke a general explosion, and that concerns us closely. The charge against Yahusha of distributing, disturbing the peace was proved to the hilt, and he could not deny it. I inquired of the prisoner, the, through Alexander, whether he admits the more serious accusations. The Jews alleged that he regarded himself as the destined deliverer of the nation, which involves the end of both their authority and ours. This would constitute a much more direct defense than that for which Antipas put Yochanan to death. They cited both the public utterance in which Yahusha had spoken of a new kingdom as being imminent, and also certain admissions about himself which they said he had made to his own followers. 
this was, I suppose, the special evidence which Ananias said that they intended to produce. I put the question to him and asked him whether he considered himself to be the deliverer. So they say, he answered, indicating the high priest and his neighbors with a curt gesture of contempt. I pointed out to him that he was accused also of representing himself as king of the Jews. I asked him whether he considered himself to be that. He made the same answer, so you say, meaning, I suppose, that in neither case was there anything in his own conduct or motives to support the accusation, but that he knew well enough that he meant in any case to fix the charge upon him. He realized that he was trapped and that there was no way of escape, but he was bold and resolute. Defiant, almost insolent, they are all alike, these Jews bitter and unyielding, whether to us or to each other. Standing alone, he might be forsaken and with enemies on every side who meant his death. With his own countrymen delivering him to the Roman executioner, but he was cool and determined, like the men who engineered an attempt on the life of the great Herod and suffered the extreme torture sooner than yield an inch, a very dangerous breed. I condemned him to death. I could, of course, do nothing less. All roads led to that conclusion, Alexander. Seneca, who has a cool and, excuse me, all roads to lead to that conclusion. Alexander, who has a cool and detached way of regarding his countrymen, insists that this man, so far from posing as Messiah or King, like most, is a mischief maker during the last thirty years, did all that he could to prevent the stupid people from fastening that part on him. Alexander thinks that there is nothing that Yahusha sought to avoid so much as this, knowing that if such a conception of him spread abroad, it would deliver him into our hands and be fatal to his campaign. A hopeless campaign in any case against the priesthood and its system. Alexander has talked to some of his fellows and says that the preacher had unquestionably warned them often and in the severest terms that they were not to regard him or speak of him as the Messiah, the Deliverer, whom all the Jews expect, and that it was only when he, through that of the old conception of him, had died away in Galilee, that he decided to come up to Jerusalem. It may be, but I am sure that if he was not dang a dangerous rebel yesterday, he would have been tomorrow. For either he would have succeeded in his assault on the priesthood, or he would not. If he had not, how long would a man of his temperament, so passionate, headstrong, and bold, 
have abstained from making that appeal to the patriotic feelings of all these Jews, which always, always meet with a quick response. Even when made by men of much power, less powerful character than his. You remember Procula's and Alexander's description of the scene in Galil, in Galilee, and supposing that he had conceivably made headway against the priests and all the mummery of the temple ritual. How long would it have been before he turned upon Caesar and the sacrifices to Rome and to Caesar himself? Would he have respected the cult of Divus Augustus, do you suppose? But long before we had to consider that eventuality, we should have had to intervene with force between their contending factions. Why, as it is, they are almost in a state of suppressed civil war, ready to fly at each other's throats. Give them a bad governor, a governor even half as bad as they say I am, and the feud between those who tolerate us and those who despise the tolerators will break into open war. This is an unfruitful soil in all respects but one. The seeds of disorder will grow if you only scratch the soil. My policy is to destroy them the moment that they sprout. But I had forgotten. Allow me one word about the inscription announcing the offenses of Yahusha. It was Melech Yahudi, king of the Jews, set up over the cross. The Pharisees were indignant. They themselves want a king of the Jews. It would give them the greatest pleasure to see Caesar overthrown tomorrow and a Jewish king installed. <laughs> Not a half-Jew like Herod, who would rule over the country through them and suppress their Sadducean rivals, but it angered them to see the precious title, Melech of Yahudim, the king of the Jews, held up to ridicule. It was too plain a reminder of their servitude. Besides, they thought it an insult that a crucified criminal, a presumptuous countryman who had defied them should be labeled king. I took a short way with them that I have written, I have written. What I have written, I have written. I said, and bade them be gone. I know the breed. From the moment that this Yahusha set up his individual judgment against theirs, they meant to have his life. Scratch a priest and find an autocrat. All the world over, if a man says he will use his own intelligence about things divine, the priests prick up their ears and feel their knives. If he goes further and tells his fellow men that they are also are entitled to use their own intelligence, off with his head, and there is an end of it. I run on so, my dear Seneca. The subject carries me away. I must apologize to you again. I am afraid that 
even you will find this subject tedious, for now uh, much has happened. What does it matter? What does it matter? One Jew or, or le more or less, I wish I could find a substitute for Adoticus. And thus ends the uh, correspondence that we have to the Senator Seneca from Pontius Pilate. But this is not all of them. We have all of the letters from Pontius Pilate to Herod the Great and Herod the Great back to him. They were quite great pen pals uh, sending texts back and forth, as well as we have the letters from Pontius Pilate himself in the official records of what happened to Tiberius Caesar and all of the aftermath, as well as a bit of a blurb in the very last uh, unpublished chapter of the book of Acts, where Paul of Tarsus goes up into the Great Britain and preaches from Mount Lud and then climbs back over the uh, strait and back into Gaul and Spain, and he mentions some things about Pontius Pilate, pull those recordings of YHWHY out, and uh, keep learning, my friends. May Yahweh keep you, and may his countenance of shalom shine upon you all the days of your life to you, yourself, your family, your house, and all that you have. Shalom.